This is a brief video on fetal growth abnormalities. We're going to be talking about both big babies and small babies, as well as how they lead up to that point and some of the consequences of large and small fetuses and babies. Let's start off with this chart here that shows gestational age and appropriate sizes by gestational age. We see across that bottom x-axis here that we have the weeks of gestation as well as the weight of the fetus or baby. And it's important to note that before the baby is delivered, of course, that weight is an estimated fetal weight based on the size usually obtained from ultrasound. So that's an estimate, but it's usually pretty accurate, and it's usually a pretty good assessment of if the baby is too big or too small for gestational age. A baby that falls under the 10th percentile would be called small for gestational age, and that's what we're going to talk about first. So small for gestational age, SGA, as we said, is a baby whose weight falls below the 10th percentile for its gestational age on the bottom. Not exactly identical to small gestational age is intrauterine growth restriction. Now, it's important to note that these two definitions, IUGR and SGA, aren't exactly the same. You can be small for gestational age and still have normal growth. Intrauterine growth restriction specifically means failure to achieve potential size. So a baby that's just going to be small, perhaps because both of the parents were small and mom's uterus is very small, could be small for gestational age without intrauterine growth restriction. Intrauterine growth restriction is pathologic, whereas SGA could be normal if it's just a very small person that falls under that 10th percentile. Intrauterine growth restriction can then be broken down into symmetric or asymmetric growth restriction, and that ratio is about 20 to 80% symmetric to asymmetric. When we're talking about symmetry here, we're talking about symmetry between the head and the abdomen, not left and right symmetry, but a baby whose head is too big for the abdomen or abdomen is too small for the head, um, and asymmetric is when the abdomen is too small for the head. One of the definitions of IUGR is when the fundal height is three centimeters smaller than expected. So if the fundal height is supposed to show a 30 week baby and it really is three centimeters or more, say it's at 26 or 27 week fundal height, then that's, uh, that's one way to diagnose IUGR. There are several risk factors for intrauterine growth restriction. Some of these are listed here, like maternal hypertension, diabetes, lupus, cardiovascular disease, placental infarction, placental abruption, villamentous cord, which essentially means that the cord, instead of inserting into the middle of the placenta, inserts into the fetal membranes and then has to travel between the amnion and the chorion. There are several causes of, of intrauterine growth restriction. These include teratogens, smoking, alcohol, cocaine, hypertension in the mother, preeclampsia in the mother, infections, and you want to think of your torch infections, such as TMV, such as CMV and rubella, anemia, multiple gestations, genetic and chromosomal abnormalities, poor placental perfusion, poor nutrition, and anatomic abnormalities. And you can see how these kind of match up with some of the risk factors. Anatomic abnormalities might be like a velamentous cord. Placental perfusion issues might be related to cardiovascular disease if a mom has a problem with peripheral arteries. Nonetheless, you want to try to identify the cause of the intrauterine growth restriction with karyotype, ultrasound, and screens for infection. If a baby is suspected to have intrauterine growth restriction, you do want to give special attention to that baby and monitor them more frequently with ultrasounds, with non-stress tests, and perhaps even Doppler velocimetry. One myth is that bed rest is recommended for moms who sh are showing to have intrauterine growth restriction, but major studies have been done that show that bed rest does not improve outcomes. If the fetus is in distress, or if mom's health is in danger because of the pregnancy, you do want to induce delivery. If baby is starting off on the growth curve and then all of a sudden drops off the growth curve and uh, starts being at a much lower percentage, for instance, if they're usually at 9%, but they all of a sudden drop to 2% in the span of a week or so, you might induce delivery if baby drops off the growth curve. 
And in general, a smaller infant has greater morbidity and mortality. There's a correlation between smaller babies and worse outcomes. Some other terms that you might apply to a baby once it is born are the birth weights. A low birth weight is a baby that is born at less than 2,500 grams. A very low birth weight baby is one that is less than 1,500 grams. And if a baby is smaller than 1,000 grams or one kilogram, you call that extremely low birth weight. <clears throat> now let's talk about some babies that are too big for gestational age, and that's this entire area up here above the 90th percentile. We're going to talk about large for gestational age. Again, definition is a weight that's above the 90th percentile for gestational age. This can also be diagnosed with fetal ultrasounds. You'll see a baby that looks too big. Risk factors here include diabetes or gestational diabetes. So this could be a pre-existing diabetes in the mom or a diabetes that started during the pregnancy. Obesity, excess maternal weight gain, advanced maternal age, usually in moms that are greater than 40 years old. If the fetus is a male, you have a higher chance of having large for gestational age baby. And some genetic disorders cause overgrowth, such as Beckwith-Weidman syndrome causes big babies. Another term to know is macrosomia, which literally means big body. And the definition for this is arguable, but it's usually agreed that it's a baby weighing over 4,000 to 4,500 grams. Complications of having a big baby usually arise during delivery, and these include shoulder dystocia or other birth trauma, jaundice, poor APGAR scores, that's APGAR scores that are lower than what's acceptable, and hypoglycemia in the neonatal period. Hypoglycemia is usually associated with diabetes and gestational diabetes, but it can also happen with macrosomia. And it's also uh, a macrosomic baby is at increased risk for hypoglycemia, even in the absence of diabetes. This has been a short video on fetal growth abnormalities. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.